Hey, my name is Jerry Pachendorf. Um, we're in Detroit, Michigan. Um, I guess I'm a Silicon Valley refugee of sorts. Uh, my friends and I like to build for the internet. And about three and a half years ago, I moved to Detroit, Michigan to um, experiment with putting a great American Rust Belt city on the internet in new ways. And along the way, probably fell in love with the whole place more than I thought. The name of your project? Loveland Technologies is our company. And so how do you apply those concepts that you just mentioned uh, to land use through that? Well, we went, we have a, an, an interesting adventure because when we started three years ago, our first project was called Micro Real Estate. And you could purchase little square inches of real land city so it was, it was a dollar per square inch and we bought vacant lots and then you could log into the micro hood via the internet online so the idea was you know you put your dollars into the machine and then you'd log into your property and see who your neighbors were and you could you could come up with a story about what you wanted to do with your space but you could also visit the property and um, we actually were the, one of the first projects on Kickstarter ever like the first dozen that came out when the site launched and so that had put us in this kind of like interesting domain between interactive city mapping and, and crowdfunding and crowdsourcing. And then from there, we kind of, you know... So, but were people actually buying the plots? Sure, yeah, we bought... Well, it's it's a form of social ownership or novelty ownership, do you know what I mean? You get... I mean, we... Loveland owns the deed to the properties. How, how much land does Loveland own in Detroit? We own two vacant lots, which is a lot of inches. So, the um, you know, the way we did it was the our, our first micro hood that we called it. It was, we named it Plymouth, and it was nine by nine feet, which is roughly 10,000 square inches. So we, we issued a first series, like we did it in seasons, sort of. So like season one was 10,000 inches, and there were almost 600 people from around the city and the state and the world that inch vested, you know, and can now log into the little properties and have to visit and stuff. We had a realization along the way that there's there was really no difference between a square inch and a house, or a micro hood in a neighborhood, except for scale, and the internet just kind of laughs at scale meaning we can take real city data and plug it plug it into our maps and suddenly we could look at who owns everything in a neighborhood, you know, or what, what projects are happening, you know. If you walk by a vacant lot, it should occur to you that you should be able to get in contact with the owner and maybe not even want to buy it, but strike up a request to plant a garden there or put a sculpture there or hang out and have an event there. And right now, people are totally unconscious of that in, in almost any city, I think. Detroit's very inspiring because you know, when you have a city that has you know, more than 100,000 properties owned by just the city itself that it doesn't really want to own, and 90,000 empty buildings, and, you know, all the rest of it, finding out who owns what, finding out how to get site control of it, clean it, work on it, buy it, build on it, um, becomes obvious not as just a good investment, but as a way to make your neighborhood whole or right again or safe. So there's a whole different level of motivation to it. Uh, um, we're in a neighborhood called Rush Park right now. So this is, this is, um, it's kind of a long story about how the neighborhood got this way, but this, this was definitely developed by wealthy Detroiters in the, here's an example of what I would call a Chia house, right? I don't know a better name for that, but that would be, you know, that's, that's, uh, it's what creates an interesting tension in the city sometimes is that there's a lot of stuff that just straightforwardly needs to be cleaned up and cleaned out. But then sometimes you'll get stuff that passes over into this new form of like nature meets industry meets man-made thing, and it's it's beautiful. You would keep it this way for something like this. I I personally would. I mean, is not it not very it's, usable? Is it? It's a no. It's not usable. And it, it, okay. usable. Well, let's just cut the loss and say that this is not going to be a regularly habitable residential house again. But what if this was a beautiful sculptural hangout spot? where let's open up the back and make it a place where people could sit down in the back and watch movies, you know what I mean? Or have, have this be something that's, that it was, was um, you, you know, take, take the husk of the house, keep that, keep the beautiful evidence of the, the life that went on there in that way, but then repurpose the material into something that works in today's terms. So no, I don't think it's a clear wind to tear that down. I think, uh, you know, again, it, it always comes down as well to what neighbors and what the neighborhood think.